Hello, everyone. My final paper representation. The topic is Jesuit China Mission Revisit. My thesis statement, the history of the missions of the Jesuits in China, especially those of the Italian Jesuit priest Matteo Ricci, provides valuable insight into Christian ministries in the postmodern and post-Christian culture, including immigrant culture of North America. First, I would provide to you some biblical foundation. The opening slides of the founding documents of Jesuit <coughs> declares that the society was founded for, quote, whoever designs to serve as a soldier of God, to strive especially for the defense and propagations of the faith, and for the progress of souls in Christian life and doctrine. End quote. This is therefore sometimes refers to God's soldiers, God's marines, or the company, which in involved from reference to Ignatius history. Ignatius is the founder of Jesuit. Ignatius history as a soldier and the society's commitment to accepting orders anywhere and to induce any conditions. The first uh, biblical words I would provide to you is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 to 13. It's about the armors of God in relation to God's soldier, God's marines, that's Ignatius' history or his background as a soldier. The Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 to 13 provides the foundation of apologies in defense of Christian faith, and it is also in relation to Ritchie's defense Christian faith against uh, Buddhism and Taoism. <laughs> and the second biblical verse I would provide to you is First uh, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 23. This biblical word provides an example of the strategies of cross-cultural missions employed by the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 23, the Apostle Paul explains his strategies of cultural accommodation in cross-cultural missions as limiting a Christian freedom to serve the kingdoms of God so that he might act like the indigenous people according to the context of his Gentile ministry. And this is also in relation to Richard's cultural accommodation principle. So the last biblical verse I would provide to you is Genesis chapter 47, verse 7 to 10. It describes an interesting story of Jacob with implications to immigrant theology of Christian missions. In Genesis chapter 47, verse 7 to 10, Jacob as a new immigrant in Egypt. He was interviewed by Pharaoh. He describes his life abroad as pilgrimage. However, he blessed Pharaoh because of 
his status not only of Israel's patriarch, but also of the father of the Egyptian prime minister, that is Joseph. This blasting significance of Christian evangelism and social justice can be applied to ritual. Like the patriarch Jacob, ritual can be considered as an Italian immigrant minister in Ming dynasty of ancient China. Because rituals arrive in China at the age of 30 in 1552, and he spent the rest of his life in China until he dies in Beijing in 1610 at the age of 57. He established the cathedrals of the Immaculate Conception in Beijing. This is the oldest uh, Catholic church in the city of Beijing. The second part of my presentation is cultural accommodation. First, I would give you the general principle. The overlap of Confucianism with Christianity in pursuit of moral excellence. That is to be an authentic gentleman. It's combined with introduction of Western science, that is, the pursuit of reasoning, provided foundations for successful mission of Jesuit in China, as well as the modernization of Chinese culture. <clears throat> I would use a Richard's sentence to indicate it. Quote, the laws of God was in commodities with the natural light of reason, and then with what their first sages taught in their books. This literature mentions the natural light of reason is reason is one factor, and then what the first sages talk. The first stage of the talk is about how to become authentic gentleman. It's the moral excellence. Then I would provide to use the methods of moral savor. It's a Latin word. Moral savor means gentle and then sweet methods. Richard plans to convert the Chinese people. He adopts the gentle and sweet master to deal with his host culture. That is, the missionaries should learn the language, the culture, and the native ways of life of the country in which they work in order to adopt to its customs, customs and um, respect its traditions unless it contradicts Christian morality, which was generously known as cultural accommodation. The third part of cultural accommodation is cultural exchange in respect and dignity. On the one hand, Richard and his followers, Jesuits, was able to assure the Chinese scholars and officials who followed Jesuit that they indeed treat Chinese friends as equals and that the Christian message they brought was respectful of China's old culture and national dignity. On the other hand, literature was also benefited from the welcoming and questions of friends like Xu Guangqi and their 
passions and revealing to mature rituals, Chinese way of thought, and cultural treasures. The interactions between these two, the friendly Renaissance missionary and the earliest Confucian scholar, it's a fascinating chapter in the history of scientific cultures and spiritual exchange. The full part is the dialogue strategy. The book of the true meaning of the law of heaven written by Richer is not considered to be a typical catechism in the forms of short questions followed by short answers that are to be memorized by new Christians. Rather, it is a work to attract readers to the reception of Christianity. Richards wrote it as a dialogue between a Confucian scholar and a sage from the East. It is the first time by a Christian scholar to try to introduce Christianity to Chinese intellectuals by using a Chinese way of thinking. Many of the statements found in the true meaning of the law of heaven have a familiar pattern as analectics of Confucian, the classical books of Confucianism. Underneath the statement hidden the Chinese traditional value that is overlapped with Christianity. Richard's approach to non-Christians resembles in many ways of the early Christian church, the theological tradition of church father, such as Clement of Alexandria, who brought the heritage of Homer and Plato to the service of Christian thought, as well as the emergency church movement, the ECM movement in our postmodern and post-Christian culture because the emergency church movement also emphasized conversation and dialogue. The fifth part of the cultural accommodation is PLR methodology. Richard applies the distinction between catechism and Christian doctrine to his preaching ministry by adopting indirect preaching and direct preaching according to whether his audience was a rare elite or new believer. If it is a rare elite, it is uh, indirect preaching. If it is new believer, it is direct preaching. I will explore it more on the application part of uh, my presentation at the end of it. Now it's come to the third part of my presentation, is internal motivation and a personal relation. This is in relation to the individualism and the self-identity of our postmodern and post-Christian culture. First, the language. Richard's appreciation of Chinese culture can naturally from his personal curiosity and passions to cultures in general, and language in particular, which made him overcome the challenge of cultural shock and the difficulties of language learning in a creative and mysterious way. From the very beginning of language learning, Richard discovered the Chinese language as a charming art. A music and a painting combined together, it is an art which maintains his curiosity and consistent efforts to explore the mystery of this hieroglyph language in contrast to alphabetic language of Latin. 
and then finally Richard grasped it skillfully. The second part of the internal motivation and personal relation is friendship. Starting from language, Richard's journey into China was therefore a journey into the mind and the heart, the culture and the mindset of those Chinese he met. Just within a few years of landing in China, Richard had drafted and published a book in Chinese on friendship. This is in classical Chinese. So Richard should be considered the founder of Western Sinology. And the books on friendship were such indication of his self-identity as a typical Chinese scholar. The third part of internal motivation and relationship, its social structure, was eventually called strategies. Richard also tried to understand the Chinese social structure as well as the essence of Chinese mind. Richard wrote the books on friendship because of what China had talking about the importance of true and influential friends to maintain his presence in the country. The concept of personal relationship or guanxi in Chinese has always been central to any understanding of Chinese social structure. It forms an essential part of network within Chinese communities. On the other hand, Richard's evangelical strategy of walking along the high brown lines, this strategy also results from the lessons he learned from personal relationship in China. Richard's early attempts to winning converts amongst the common people had ended in frustration. He failed to reaching the common people. However, the success of the book on friendship reinforms his decision to shift to a top down approach by quote, whispering to power brokers, end quote. That's preaching to the royal elite rather than preaching to the masses. And here he was very successful. The four chapters of my presentation is lessons and applications. First, the pops and most of Christians, Europeans of that time, failed to endorse Richard's method of cultural accommodation. This was related to the historical case of Chinese rights controversy after Richard's death in 1610 at the age of 67. Richard borrows an unusual Chinese term, Lord of Heaven, Tianzhu in Chinese, to describe the Lord of Abraham. Despite the terms origins in traditional Chinese, worship of Heaven, he supports Chinese traditions by agreeing with the venerations of families and ancestors, even the worship of Confucian. This was often called the directive of mature ritual in history. However, Dominicum and Franciscum, these two sectors of Catholicism, missionaries, they consider this an unacceptable accommodation and later appears to the Vaticum on this issue. As a result, Pope Clement in 1704 and 1715 twice, and again Pope Benedict in 1742 reject the directives of Mature ritual and um, for bake is practice. 
However, in 1721, the Kangxi emperors of Qing dynasty disagrees with Clement's decree and bans Christian's mission in China once for all. This Chinese right controversy continues for centuries, even until now. Some contemporary Christian scholars have praised Richard as an example of beneficial enculturation, while others criticize him for distorting the gospel's message. And also, the compromised gospel is a major concern of today's missionary theology. Then another lesson is in a philosophical or theological aspect. The focus of criticisms on Richard is his methods of apologies and an understanding of Confucianism. Confucianism infused with Buddhism and Taoism involved into newer Confucianism in the late Ming, late Ming period, which Richard denied, while he insists a pure and pristine Confucianism in his Jesuit China's mission with the slogan, quote, draws close to Confucianism and repudiate Buddhism, end quote. Resulting in furious reactions from Buddhism as well as violent objections from Orthodox Confucianism, Orthodox Confucian, they are new Confucianism support. Thus may be the internal factors leading to the tragic results of Chinese rights controversies. Political speaking, Richard finally lost support of elite from both Western popes and Chinese emperors. This should be another lesson we should learn. Finally, it's my ministries in contemporary context. I have learned from the historical lessons mentioned above, and also try to apply Richard's method of indirect preaching and direct preaching in my old ministries. I'm serving the Catholic Chinese Pentecost Church and the Chinese Christian Mission of Canada in Chinatowns of downtown Calgary. Chinatown is a smaller community with the typical feature of traditional Chinese culture, with Chinese new immigrants, international students, and visiting scholars visit or stay in Chinatown. The, Chi the Christian organization in Chinatown face the challenge of cultural accommodation similar to that of Richards in Ming or Qing dynasty. I would like to embrace Richards in direct preaching as a gentle and meek way to avoid conflicts between West and Chinese culture. Most of Chinatown's residents, especially those of, uh, with the backgrounds of visiting scholars from mainland China, consider themselves to be elites, and thus hold an interest in an appreciation for Christianity. Therefore, when I approach these groups of people, I would be very careful and treat them with respect and dignity. The purpose of my preaching is to establish a peaceful dialogue or a conversation between two different cultures so that they may continue their interest and explore more and deeper about Christianity. The hidden agenda is that China should be more open to the outside world especially to the West, in order to overcome the difficulties or crises of her modernization and involvement in the global civilization. To follow the indirect preaching of Richie, unless 
on personal request. It is not necessary to talk about the belief proposed to Christianity in order to avoid potential conflict. It is enough for us to know that I am a Christian with a background of a visiting scholar, an international student, or a new immigrant similar to them. While I understand and I love and I appreciate Chinese culture as my self-identity, then the conversation would shift to cultural exchange between the West and the East. The advantage of multiculturalism and cultural diversity, the encouragement of cultural revival, the future of global culture and civilization, except in which the traditional Chinese culture of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism may be an essential contribution. However, on personal request or through personal interaction, once someone's of conversion appear, indicated as willing to get baptism and become a Christian, the preachings would be adjusted accordingly or set out a different rules for direct preaching. In direct preaching, dialogues would focus on systematic teaching of the basis of Christian faith, baptism, discipleship, life, and growth in Christ, etc. In summary, richer strategies of Jesuit China missions, including his profound respect for the diversity of culture, promoting mutual understandings and masterings of dialogues based on equality, respect, and dignity, were well praised and appreciated for 400 years. And events can be applied to the postmodern and post-Christian culture today, which includes emphasizing